I, if I recall last time, I think we had about here, we just talked about the difference between, between exocrine and uh, endocrine gland. And uh, so your skin is essentially the boundary between yourself and the world around you. And so your skin provides protection uh, and is an impermeable layer that essentially keeps your moisture inside of you there so that your cells can still live in an aqueous environment. Right? And then it also protects against other things entering that aqueous environment that can cause significant uh, damage to you. So, so it essentially is your protects your physical and biochemical integrity, uh, helps you maintain constant body temperature, which facilitates all our enzyme reactions at a given rate, uh, and keeps us kind of aware of our immediate environment surrounding us. So it's one of the largest organs in our body in terms of its overall uh, square foot, and it's, it's comprised of four types of tissue, one type of epithelium and three types of or, uh, connecting tissue. And if you actually took the human, the average human body and actually took the skin, it's about 22 square feet, which is about the size of a queen size bed spread. Just to put that into context. Right? Yeah, but it's very thin. It's only about one to two millimeters thin. And it weighs about 10 pounds. So it's, it counts for about 10 pounds of your body weight. As we talked about yesterday, we have two types of skin, thin skin and thick skin. So the, the most common type of skin all over your body would be thin skin. So thick skin is, is uh, limited to areas of your body where you have a greater friction. Uh, so the palmar surface of your hand and the sole of your foot, which would be more correctly called the plantar surface. So the skin provides us with many sensations. And so one critical one is thermoregulation. So we belong to a group of animals that maintain body, body temperature, whereas other groups like fish, rabbit, amphibians, and, and reptiles do not maintain body temperature. So their metabolic processes are affected by ambient temperatures around them. Uh, and so we have to make sure we keep our body temperature high enough that all our metabolic processes can occur. So if your core temperature were to drop around 92, you would enter a severe state of hypothermia, and there's probably a good chance you're not going to survive it. If your core temperature were to elevate to 105, 106, you'd be in a state of hyperthermia, and there's probably a darn good chance you're not going to survive it. So really our, our body temperature is, it has a narrow range, and it's because of the impact on proteins and enzymes that run all the biochemical uh, materials that we need to, to do to keep ourselves going. And so uh, the thermal th regulation component is to make sure we don't lose excessive heat and to make sure we can lower body temperature if temperature elevates. And so the way we keep our body temperature lower is we produce sweat, and when the sweat evaporates off the surface of our skin, it carries heat with it. And so we're actually depending upon the behavior of water molecules to actually help uh, lower our body temperature. Okay. And then we can adjust the flow of blood to our dermis by adjusting blood vessels. So when you get really, really cold, some people's hands look very, very white because they've actually shut blood flow to their hands to prevent heat loss. And if we're really, if we're really warm, our, our skin turns very, very pink because we've increased blood supply to it, trying to dissipate the heat. And then uh, what we have, in addition to our ability to, to try to control heat loss across our body, is we begin to shiver. And shivering is rhythmic contractions of, of muscle. And that requires us to use ATP. 
And every time we convert ATP to ADP plus phosphate, we give it off heat energy. And so that's how we, it's actually our, our core muscle mass that helps us maintain body temperature. And that's why elderly people are oftentimes very cold and get very cold very easy because they've lost muscle mass uh, with the aging process. And then it makes it harder for them to actually uh, maintain body temperature. Uh, and then during exercise events, we actually have to try to adjust all of this. And so there's usually not a problem when we have moderate exercise because what happens is we can move blood to our skin to dissipate the heat uh, rather quickly. But what we, where we see athletes to get, to get, get into trouble uh, is during extreme ex exercise events where they are, are, are working so hard at whatever activity they're doing that they're building up tremendous amounts of heat from muscle contraction and the conversion of ATP to ADP. And then the body has to make an adjustment to blood supply. So ideally, it would like to move a lot of blood to the skin where it can dissipate the heat. But because there's so much muscle activity going on, it needs to make sure the blood is flowing to muscles to supply oxygen to the muscles. And so every fall, and it's already happened this fall, uh, usually in late August, early September, when all high schools and, and colleges and, and pros get back together to play football, they wear all that heavy equipment that, that also keeps them from losing body heat quickly. And somebody dies from heat stroke because the body temperature goes way up. And it already happened in Southeast of the United States uh, this fall. So, so it's something to think about in relationship to that. All right. So if we're not exercising, then we also keep uh, kind of a pool of blood in all of the vascular network within our, within, our, within our skin. That allows us to actually have a little excess blood that we can kind of store. So we think about that as a blood reserve. And then under stress, we can move that blood uh, to different areas of the body that we might need increased circulation to. And then the other thing is protection that we talked about. So the cells at the bottom of the stratum spinosum that we talked about, excuse me, at the, at the stratum bacilli we talked about yesterday, that bottom row of cells that's attached to the basement membrane in our keratinized stratified spinous has tight junctions. And so remember, the value of tight junctions is that fluid can't pass between cells. And so those tight junctions help us limit water loss or water gain based upon the environment around us that we're in. Uh, and we also store lipids in our, in our uh, skin. And we also produce oil on our skin to retard uh, evaporative water loss as well. Uh, we're going to talk about cells that actually produce a pigment that protect us against UV light. So the colorations of skin worldwide have are really been driven over time by the amount of sunlight that populations are exposed to. So if you look at the, if you look at the globe and you look at the, where we're at, then it's, it's pretty amazing because at the equator, the sun is the most overhead. And at the equator, you have 12 hours of light and 12 hours of dark every day of the year. And the more further south or north you go, so in Spokane, we're here, and right now we're losing about seven minutes of sunlight a day. And so we're moving toward the winter solstice where we will have very very short periods of light. And then in June we have really long periods of light. Well, the other thing then is that if you're up here, the sun is passing through a lot more uh, atmosphere than if you're on the equator. So if you ever go to the equator, and lay on a beach, you burn easy because there's lots of UV light that your body's being exposed to. And so it's not a surprise that populations that 
are equatorial or dark skin because the pigment that we tan with protects us from UV light. And the problem with UV light is that light travels in a wavelength. And so when you look at those bottom cells of your epidermis, this kind of bacilli, then there are mitotic cells. And so it's critically important we can protect the DNA and the nucleus of those cells. Well, what actually happens is when this stuff hits DNA molecules, it makes the DNA molecules vibrate. And UVA, which is the, which is the most poor, uh, powerful of the wavelengths of UV light, actually vibrates the molecules so rapidly that DNA comes apart. It actually causes our DNA molecules to come apart. We actually have a repair enzyme that tries to stick DNA back together. So the pigment that we develop when we tan uh, reflects UV light away from those cells. And that's why dark complexions are, are closely related to areas where high UV light has been, populations have been exposed for generations to those high UV light. So we'll talk about that. And then we have Langerhans cells that are critical to our immune system so that if we do get uh, parasites or other thing invading our, our epidermis, these Langerhans cells are the first line of defense. And then sensations are critically important to protecting our skin. So our skin is loaded with sensory apparatus that respond to touch and pressure like we talked about yesterday. So what was the touch receptor that we looked at yesterday in lab? Meisenheimer's corpus. My experience, yeah. And what was the pressure reset? The Sinian corpuscle, yeah. And then our skin responds to vibrations, to heat, to cold, to pain. We have all these sensations that, that we interpret as well. Okay. So the interesting trade off with what we just talked about about UV light and exposure to UV light and skin damage is that UV light hitting the cells of our epidermis cause them to produce the precursor for vitamin D. And so it's direct sun exposure to your skin that allows you to produce the precursor molecule for that vitamin D. It then enters your blood, and then that molecule has to, be, has to pass through the liver or the kidney to be activated. Well, recent studies uh, have shown that in the United States that vitamin D deficiency is increasing, and particularly in young kids, uh, much more than it was in the past. So, because we don't go out in the sun as much as we are worried about cancer. So it's a very interesting dilemma to face. So there's kids now on high doses of vitamin D supplements to prevent that from happening. And the key to vitamin D is it's critically important for our ability to absorb calcium. Uh, through our gut lining. So that's why we fortify milk with vitamin D. Because then you have vitamin D and you have the calcium in the milk and you can facilitate the uptake of calcium. And so we, in the next unit, we'll actually talk about this and see what it does to the skeletal system if you have kids with, with high deficiencies of vitamin D. And then our, our, our skin also acts at, in, in secretion and excretion of waste products. And so we lose about uh, half a liter of water a day just through perspiration. Uh, and we lose small amounts of salt, uh, carbon dioxide, ammonia, urea. So we use it to get rid of waste products as well. So we talked about yesterday in lab that uh, we divide the skin into the epidermis, which is the surface, the dermis, divided into two layers, papillary and reticular region, and then the lowest layer, the subcutaneous layer, or the uh, hypodermis. And then what we see is a bunch of, a bunch of uh, accessory uh, structures in our skin, many of them which arise from the epidermis itself. So we talk about sweat glands and oil glands and hair as arising from the epidermis itself. Then we have a elaborate uh, network of blood vessels and 
a elaborate network of nerves that help us with sensations uh, that, we, that we're dependent upon. So when we think about the skin, we can look at those layers uh, that protect us, like the epidermis and the dermis and the hypodermis. And that's our cutaneous membrane. And then associated with that, we have the accessory structures that provide sensations, produce secretions, and protect epidermal surfaces. So what we're going to do is we're going to kind of look at both of those uh, in a way in which we can kind of understand what they're doing and be able to visually uh, interpret it on bottles and slides. So the epidermis is the outer part of your cutaneous membrane. And it's comprised of peritonized stratified squamous. So it provides that protection from water loss and pathogen uh, invasion. And then also uh, synthesizes vitamin D. The underlying tissues of the cutaneous membrane are the dermis. And because the epidermis is non-vascular, then the underlying connective tissue uh, has the blood supply. So the areolar tissue in the papillary region of the dermis is critically important to nourishing those epidermal cells. And so it has to supply the stratum bacilli cells with all the resources they need to undergo mitosis all the time so that we can constantly replicate and replace our skin surface and keep it healthy. Uh, if we do get cuts or openings in our epidermis, then the cells in the areolar tissue, mast cells, plasma cells, that we talked about when we talked about the different types of cells in connective tissue are critically important to preventing the spread of spread of pathogens where they can take over organ systems and kill you. Uh, and so it's critically important. We use it to store lipids. Uh, we actually have to use connective tissue to attach our skin to our underlying uh, tissues so our skin doesn't come off. So if you ever if you skin chicken then as you take the skin off the chicken, there's this white stuff that you're kind of tearing as you're taking it off. That's connective tissue. And it's doing exactly what it, connective tissue is designed by me to do, connecting structures together. So we have to have connective tissue that attaches our skin to our underlying tissues. Uh, and then, again, sensory receptors and blood vessels that we're going to talk about. So other accessory structures we look at lab Estrogen with hair follicles. And so we have hair for providing us with sensations uh, about contact with our skin. We have hair in unique areas of our body, our, our head, and other areas that pre protect underlying skin that, that's very thin skin. And we, we can use it then as a heat loss agent too. So little tiny babies have no hair when they're first born have to wear little stocking caps because you lose so much heat from the surface of your, your head that and if you're, or if you can't thermal regulate well like a little tiny baby, then we have to protect them from that. So we have nails that arise off the, the epidermis at the end of our digits, and that's because the bones in both your toes and your fingers don't go all the way to the end. So the end is all soft tissue, and so, if you were to uh, smash your finger accidentally with a hammer or something, if you didn't have these nails, your finger would just pop like a grape. And because there would be nothing to prevent the soft tissue from just exploding up. And so that's what nails are really designed to do, is protect the ends of your fingers uh, from trauma. And then we have extra pink glands, which are sweat glands, oil glands, uh, that are all connected, remember, to the skin surface by a duct. And so sweat glands assist us with thermal regulation. They help us secrete waste products. Oil glands, sebaceous glands, help lubricate the epidermis and hair and prevent us from, from getting dry, uh, dry hair and skin. And then some of the uh, types of sweat glands we have, particularly apocrine sweat glands, uh, are involved in production of pheromones. And then pheromones are chemical communicators that we use unknowingly with each other. Uh, so the, the, first, the first part of this that was really understood was a study done, it was actually done at an all-girls all Catholic college. 
and it was done by some nuns that were teaching science there. And so when the freshmen came to college, they always recorded when they were having their periods. And then by the end of the first school year, all the women that lived close to each other were all having periods at the same time. And I'm the only male in my household, and I have seen that happen as well. And so that's done with pheromones, just pheromonal communication. So we, we do an amazing amount of stuff with pheromones that we're unaware of. And there's been a doubt of research uh, on pheromones, trying to figure out perfumes and stuff. So, so it's probably love at first scent. Right. So the, the one thing that you definitely need to know is when we look at the layers of the skin, what kind of tissue is found in it. So the epidermis is, as we've been talking about, keratinized stratified squamous. The dermis, we divide into a papillary region and reticular region. The papillary region, which is the folded region, is areolar tissue. The reticular region, which is the rest of the dermis, is dense irregular connecting tissue. And when we get to the hypodermis at the bottom, it's areolar tissue we've dominated by adipocytes. So we call it adipose tissue. And so those are the four types of tissue that, that typically make up our, our layers of our skin. And so certainly under a microscope, we worked on, on uh, finding those layers. So there at the top up there uh, is actually the epidermis that we're seeing there up here. And then right under that is a thin layer we're seeing right here, which is the re papillary region. So the reticular region of the dermis is from that area where the pointer is up there all the way down to here. And then where these fat cells are dominating is the hypodermis. And then what we'll see is all of our accessory structures we've been talking about are, are connected to the dermis and then passed down into the, I don't mean, connected to the epidermis, passed down into the dermis, even down into the hypodermis. So the one thing we worked on in lab yesterday was when we look at keratinized stratified squamous, the cells are undergoing change or differentiation. So they're actually going from polygonal type cells, which are the most effective way to do mitosis, to flat squamous cells at the surface. And so since the cells are undergoing differentiation, then we can divide, we can actually divide the, the epidermis into layers of strata. So the bottom one is the most critical, the stratum bacilli, because that's what organizes all of your epidermis, because these cells are attached like any desmosomes to the base of the membrane. They're also attached to each other by desmosomes, and they also have tight junctions and, that we talked about. So they're our critical layer that keeps our epidermis organized. And they're also the mitotic layer, so that when cells undergo mitosis, this daughter cell, or these chromosomes will be pulled to, will remain attached to the basement membrane. This daughter cell will be, a, will be pushed upward eventually and continue to push upward. So on thin skin, it takes about 25 days for this daughter cell to eventually end up clear at the top up here and be sloughed off. So we're, we're replacing our skin about every 25 days. So the bottom one's critically important and it is the mitotic layer. So this is the layer we actually want to protect. Uh, the, these cells are all going to die, so, so the urgency to protect them is not critical, but these cells it's critical to protect because they're the ones that are going to give rise to, to uh, the new cells over time. So the stratum spinosum occurs because the cells are going to change shape from polygonal shape to flat. So as they get pushed upward, they get these little projections or spines on it. So that's where spinosum comes from. The blood supply is down here, so as the cells get further and further up here, they become physiologically stressed, have trouble getting oxygen, having trouble getting nutrients. And that triggers a gene that, to be expressed that causes them to make keratin. And as they make keratin and get embedded in keratin, it kills them. So it's classic programmed cell death in our body. So the area where they're making keratin is the stratum granulosum. When the keratin is, is not hard yet, the cell boundaries are hard to see, so we end up with a layer called the stratum lucidum, where it looks pretty transparent, and that's only unique to what type of tissue? Thick skin. Thick skin, right? 
then we have various thicknesses of stratum corneum on top. So we just make sure you know all those layers in their order. Uh, we went through this in lab, so. So what I want to do is come back and talk about the, the types of cells that we find within characterized stratified springs. So when we're looking at the most common cell within characterized stratified springs, you know, they are keratinocytes. So I want to make a point. So we call them squamous cells because of their appearance, because they are flat. We refer to them as keratinocytes because of their function, where they produce keratin. Okay. So it's the same cell. We're just, in one way, we're characterizing them because they're flat to identify a type of tissue. Keratinocyte tells us that they're the cells that produce keratin that protect us. So they're the most common cell that we would see, and they produce that waterproof seal keratin. So another cell that's critically important to us are melanocytes. And so melanocytes are cells, are the cells that produce the pigment melanin that makes our skin dark. <coughs> so if you look at a broad cross-section of individuals from somebody who's very, very pale to somebody who's very, very dark, from histology, we see approximately the same number of melanocytes in the skin. So it's not a difference in number of melanocytes. It's actually a difference in the functioning of melanocytes and whether they make melanin. So if we go to the to the far extreme, there's a gene mutation for the enzyme that helps us make melanin, and they have no melanin at all, so we call those albinos, to people that produce a lot of melanin uh, and makes their skin very dark. Are squamous cells the only ones that can produce keratin? To my knowledge. All right, so if you look at the relative placement of melanocytes, uh, then the melanocytes are always toward the bottom of our epithelium, but they're above the stratum bacilli, because the cells we want to protect from UV damage are the stratum bacilli. So what the melanocytes do is they send out little extensions that act as umbrellas. And then the more melanin that these melanocytes have, then the better they are at bouncing UV light away. So the key to melanin is that when you create these little extensions, then UV light doesn't penetrate your, your skin as well. And it then becomes very protective to the skin itself. So the connection between skin cancer and, and UV exposure uh, is two. So we have one type of skin cancer. We're going to do this in more detail here in a minute. So we have one type of skin cancer that we call basal cell carcinoma. And it arises because your basal cells at the bottom here have actually been damaged by UV light and the DNA has been damaged. So as we damage DNA, it doesn't work as well. And that's what leads to that. Fortunately, that's a very easy cancer to remedy if it's caught early. So the other cancer is called melanoma. And it's called a melanoma because it's a cancer of melanocytes. So those are melanocytes that have been significantly damaged by sunlight. And then it is a very aggressive cancer and much harder to uh, deal with if, if it gets very far along and has a much higher mortality rate. So it really depends on whether we're looking at cancers being starting here or cancers starting here on the, the mortality rate and outcome. At, at the end. So the other cells we have are Langerhans cells, and they're migratory cells that move around within our epidermis. So they're not in fixed cells. And just kind of as we go forward, uh, when we look at cells and we look at nuclei, uh, cells have various changes to the shapes of their nuclei. We began to talk about it with epithelium where squamous cells have flattened nuclei, uh, cuboid cells have round nuclei, 
Well, white blood cells typically have nuclei that are divided into lobes. And so with this cell, instead of having this big round nucleus, these rounder nuclei like we're seeing here, we're seeing a nucleus that's, that's low. That's a real classic characteristic of, what, of certain types of white blood cells. So that always tells us that this cell is a modified white blood cell when we see a nucleus like that. So the Langeron cells are, in fact, immune system cells. They belong to, uh, they belong to uh, that group of white blood cells that helps us. Now what's interesting, if we look at the picture here, is that Langeron cells that didn't come out of the blood uh, go up into the epidermis, but they go up into the layers of the epidermis above the melanocytes. So that means that they are being exposed to UV light at a higher amount. And so what actually happens is that they're easily damaged by UV light. And so sometimes if you get a really bad sunburn, uh, then your skin becomes easily infected. And it's because the melanocytes were all, were all damaged by that high exposure that created the sunburn. And you have to go through and replace them. All. So it's pretty, pretty amazing to look at. And Merkel cells, our cells are always going to be clear at the bottom of our, our epi, epidermis, so with the strat, within the stratum bacilli layer. And they're actually a cell that interacts with the sensory neuron. Uh, so they're a text cell that becomes very important to sensory input. So when we look at, uh, so when we actually look at uh, Merkel cells, we, we usually find it in the stratum bacilli. And then the, the sensory neurons are part of the dermis. And when this cell gets compressed against the sensory neuron, then it, tell, it sends a signal about being touched. That's another touch reason. All right, so just to kind of continue our thought about melanin. So melanin is critically important because it protects us from UV light. So in a general population, people who burn easy because they don't produce a lot of melanin in their fair complexion have a much greater risk of skin cancers than people who, who actually tan easy or are darker complexion because they protect, protect themselves as well from UV light. So what we actually what we actually do is we take an we we need an amino acid called tyrosine that we can convert to melanin. And so that's the real key to the enzyme. We have to have an enzyme that can make that conversion. And as I said, the studies have been done where we've looked at people with different skin colors from being very light to very dark appear to have all the same melanocytes. So at one time we thought that, that light people had fewer melanocytes and dark people had more melanocytes. But that doesn't appear to be true from a lot of histological things we've done. So it's actually the relative uh, activity of those melanocytes on their ability to produce melanin. So dark complected people produce a lot of melanin, light complected people produce fewer melanin. And it's actually probably just a classic example uh, of natural selection over time uh, and populations that arose near the equator versus populations further north. Now what's actually fascinating with that is it occurs in all animals as well. Uh, the further you go north, the lighter the animals are. That's why. Yeah. Not, and not just humans. So, so it's really related to you. Really. So, and then what we can do is we can, we can actually add other pigments to melanin as well. So melanin itself gives us the dark coloration. If we add beta keratin to melanin, then it gives it more of a yellow coloration. So it's an interesting interesting way in which we can alter that. So the other thing that we get is we get variations in. So freckles or aging spots that you get are where melanocytes in that area are for some reason more active than other areas around them. So that's the interesting thing to think about. So not only can we look at skin color as having the same number of melanocytes, but the melanocytes vary in, in their activity. But you can have an individual who's fairly light, but when they expose themselves to sun, they get lots of dark little spots all over, freckles. And that's because melanocytes 
those melanocytes are more active than other melanocytes. So not all, well, not all our melanocytes may have the same activity, but it's kind of interesting. So if we, if we have a gene mutation for this enzyme, tyrosinase, then we cannot produce melanin. Uh, and so people with that are, are, we would refer to as albinos. Now what's kind of in interesting is that we see that also in mammals, birds, and all vertebrates, amphibians, and fish. So that the, the lack of ability to produce pigment doesn't just occur in humans as well. And typically people that are true albinos also have pink eyes because the color of your eye is also based upon the ability to make melanin. So if you have brown eyes, you have brown eyes because you have because you can make melanin. If you have a gene mutation for making melanin uh, and at different points, then you either have green eyes or blue eyes. If you can make no melanin at all, then the blood supply in the iris reflects red light, and that's why your eyes are pink. That's why albinos look pink. Their eyes look pink. And so, so color is nothing but reflecting light. So a couple things. Do your eye, does the melanin help protect your eyes from sunlight? And if you tanned your eyes, would they go dark? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you uh, if you were to delay in tanning beds and not protect your eyes, then the high UV exposure would lead to cataracts quickly. Yeah. So the the damage that occurs to eyes uh, over time because of UV exposure is a is a clouding. Of tissue, which we call cataracts. So what we do know is that light eyes have a greater tendency to form cataracts than dark eyes, based upon exposure. So it does appear to be protective. Okay. And then, uh, as as we said, the white variety of skin color can be due to melanin. Can be due to uh, keratin. And then very light complected people look red because of underlying blood vessels and a reflection of light off of human. So color is nothing but reflection of light. So something that's pure white, like like white paper, is reflecting the whole visual spectrum. Okay. So something that's dark, like your jacket, is absorbing all the light. And so no light's coming off of it. And so hemoglobin uh, when it's attached to, has oxygen attached to it, reflects red light. And that's what gives the, the pink coloration to skin. Because the underlying uh, capillaries that contain uh, hemoglobin. So, one of the things from a clinical environment we're always concerned with then is managing exposure of UV light. And the trade off is enough exposure that you make adequate levels of vitamin D and not enough exposure where you damage skin. So it's a real trade-off. So our concerns with, with damaging skin is that we have three types of cancer that can arise. So the one we talked about was basal cell carcinoma. So we, we use the word carcinoma uh, in that because that tells us it's a cancer that originates in epithelial tissue. So any carcinoma is a cancer of epithelial tissue. So we can have a bunch of different types of carcinomas depending on where the cancer started. All right. And so basal cell is telling us it's in the bottom layer of cells in our epidermis. Uh, and it arises from, uh, from uh, the stratum bacilli from damage by UV. And as long as we can catch it and and actually uh, remove it before it can invade very deep into the dermis, then it's a very easy cancer to, to remedy. And so plastic surgeons now use a real interesting technique. So if you had a spot, you'd go to a plastic surgeon. They would actually cut it out, and then what they're gonna do is collect cells near the edge of the place they cut. They're gonna quickly stain it and put it under a microscope to see if all the cells look normal. And before you ever leave the office, if you have abnormal cells at that boundary, then they're going to cut a bigger space around it. 
and then stain those cells again and look at it. So my mom had some spots on her forehead, and I took her in at 8.30, and she was still there at 11 because he had had to do four different uh, enlargements of his, of his removal zone because he kept finding uh, uh, altered cells until, until he removed a piece about that big off her forehead. Uh, then, he, then he got a free surface. And so that's what they do now. And by doing that, they, they make sure that you can go in one time and get it removed and not have a reoccurrence. So it's real interesting. So squamous cell carcinoma is a cancer that arises from damaged keratinocytes and spatic spinosum. So again, it's another cancer because it's further toward your surface. If you catch it early and remove it, then survival rates really well. But it tends to be very aggressive and, and invasive downward into the dermis. And once it gets into the dermis, cells at the edge of the tumor can come off. And those cells can be picked up by your lymph system and transported around your body. And that's the real critical thing about cancers is you've got to catch the cancer before it metastasizes. Because once it metastasizes, then you're fighting that cancer all over the body in different places, which makes it much harder. Uh, and so the cancers that metastasize are the ones that become much more lethal. And then malignant melanoma is the most deadly because it metastasizes readily. Um, and so when you, when you look at yourself over time or when doctors look at you, they're looking at moles and other dark spots on your skin. And so there's a little acronym, ABCD, where uh, they're looking at symmetry, irregular border, mixed color and diameters over six millimeters are all of concern. So any moles like that, would, you would really want to watch uh, because they're the ones that can give, uh, give rise to molecular melanoma. And then moles, by the way, are an area where melanocytes are much more active because that's where they're dark. And so what we've been able to do with the Human Genome Project is actually find an oncogene uh, and the acronym for the acrogene is BRAF. And it's more common in men than women, and it predisposes you for malignant melanoma. So it makes your risk of malignant melanoma much higher. So oncogenes are genes that we have been able to link to cancer events. And what it appears is a lot of oncogenes are genetic material that was inserted into your DNA by viruses. And because it can be inserted in, the, in a way in which it can be passed from generation to generation, <coughs> then it becomes problematic. So. so we have other clinical words we use for abnormal skin coloring. So cyanosis is uh, bluing of the skin, largely due to a lack of oxygen. So it can occur because you're really cold, or it can occur because you've experienced you've been exposed to other things that displace oxygen, like carbon monoxide. So, so there are several reasons why. It just tells us we have a real low level of oxygen. Uh, and then if we, if we get an increase in uh, vasodilation in our skin, we turn red. The urethra is red, so urethrema is a redness of the skin. So jaundice is a yellowing in the skin, and it's due to a compound that is produced by breaking down red blood cells, and it's called bilirubin. So some babies are, have a different hemoglobin when they're inside mom. Then when they are after they're born, they have to convert the hemoglobin to normal hemoglobin. So babies undergo a very rapid breakdown of blood cells as they're converting from uh, the fetal cells they needed inside mom to adult red blood cells. And if they can't keep up, sometimes they get jaundice uh, and they get yellow uh, in appearance. And in, in a clinical environment, people with liver disease, particularly hep hepatitis A and B, will, will turn really yellow as well because of the, the building room building up. And then uh, bronzing is actually where you get to take on kind of a copper color to your skin. And there's one particular uh, hormone disorder called Addison's disease, 
where uh, where people begin to bronze. It begins on their abdomens and then moves out from the abdomen. So we're going to talk about Addison's disease later when we talk about hormones. And then Paylar is just a paleness uh, due to lack of blood flow. Albinism we talked about is a gene mutation. And then a hematoma is a clot under the skin that looks really dark, and so we call it a bruise. So when we're looking at the dermis itself, then what we worked on was the fact that the dermis is highly folded, particularly on the palmar surface and plantar surface, and the folds are called papillae. So the area where the junction between the epidermis and dermis exists, where these folds exist, is called the papillary region. So it's this upper region right here. And it's dominated by areolar or connective tissue. The rest of the dermis right here uh, is the reticular region. And it's dominated by dense irregular connective tissues, two types of uh, connective tissue making up the dermis. So yesterday in lab, we worked on making sure we could identify it in the microscope. So when we look in the dermis, we see uh, glands that have arisen embryologically from the epidermis that migrate down into the dermis where they're more protective. And then they create products for us to help us with different things. So we have aquifer sweat glands that are unique glands to your armpits, to the, the growing area, the labia and the gland schemas. And they're, they're also located around the, the nipples and the areola on, on women. And they actually produce pheromones. And so it's probably one of the ways that baby knows mom uh, early on is the pheromones from, from nursing that the baby gets from these glands associated with the nipple and the areola. Uh, and they typically don't begin to function until puberty. Uh, and then at puberty, they begin to function because of either testosterone or estrogen that the, the sex hormones. Uh, and they produce kind of an or odorous thick secretion. I, years ago when I first started teaching anatomy, I talked with a woman who was near retirement, an old lady, and she started her teaching career in grade school and middle school, and then moved to college uh, as she got an advanced degree. And she used to say when she was giving a lecture, now it would be kind of funny, Johnny was a cute little boy when he was in seventh grade, and I had him in eighth grade, grade, then he just started stinking like crazy. Because these apple and sweat glands are being active. Okay. So, so superiferous sweat glands actually produce the, what we think of as typical sweat, real water, watery sweat. But the most abundant in our skin, uh, controlled by the nervous system, involved in thermal regulation, excretion of urea, and anti biological action. So what we looked at in lab were the ecker sweat glands, because we have scalp slides to look at. So remember there are coiled tubes that's being cut. So we're going to see it cut in a number of different ways. And they produce their products by miracle, meaning the cells are unaffected by the production of products. So these can be single cells, uh, single clunger cells surrounding the ducts, because the cells are unaffected by that process. And so here's an example of uh, really loaded sweat glands in the palmar surface of the hand, where we can see sweat glands uh, very densely packed. So the other gland we looked at in the lab were, were sebaceous glands. And they're, they're typically associated with, with hairs except for the labia and the penis and the lips again. And again, they're controlled by sex hormones. So they increase their production uh, during puberty and for the rest of your life. And uh, what they do is they're designed to help lubricate, protect hair and the outer skin surface. And they're, always, they're usually always associated with hair except for those uh, unique areas of the body. Uh, and so when we looked at the lab, what we, what we saw was if we found a hair shaft, you know, we could see these big glandular masses next to it. And those are, in fact, the, the sebaceous sweat glands. And if you find a hair shaft and it's connected to the dermis of the skin, what you would actually see is this row of nuclei that looks real organized in a single row. 
is the stratum bacilli. And that stratum bacilli is actually going to be going around the gland itself and the hair itself all the way down. And that's why he told us that hair and these, and these glands develop in the epidermis and migrate downward during embryonic development into the dermis. Because we can actually follow the stratum bacilli all the way around them to get a real good cut. So it's really cool to see. So, mammillary glands, which are the breast milk producing tissue uh, within breast tissue, are anatomically very similar to sweat glands. So, from an embryological standpoint, they are, in fact, modified uh, from the epidermis and migrate down into uh, the gland area. And so uh, they produce a modified sweat that we call milk. What's interesting is that humans, like other animals, have a band embryologically where the, the, this tissue is going to develop. And so like a cat or dog can have a number of nipples in that line. Uh, women sometimes can as well. And so the normal pattern of development is to only develop two nipples, one on each side. But some women have, can have two nipples on one side and one on the other side. And then during puberty, sometimes they can develop two breasts on one side and, and one on the other side because we have a milk line uh, where that develops. And then there's a great book if you, if you want to know. Uh, it's, it's a great book about trivia, about why things happen in the human body. But the woman who wrote it's got a clever sense of humor. So the title of the book is Why Men Have Nipples. So why do men have nipples? Actually, because we have breast tissue. And we have the similar breast tissue that women have. But we aren't exposed to estrogen where it develops. But men do, do get and die from breast cancer at a much lower rate than than women do. And so that's the real, real answer. So the only, and I'll show you this when we actually do this in the reproductive unit. So usually when they show this picture in an A and P textbook, this is a is this is a lactating breast. So the reason why breasts enlarge when you're pregnant is that the, the tissue that helps you produce milk is not very large if you're not pregnant. And so it takes nine months of exposure of hormones to actually take that tissue and make it bigger so that it actually makes milk. And then if you, if you stop breastfeeding and you never become pregnant again, then all this tissue degenerates again into uh, very small amounts of tissue. And that's just a matter of energetics uh, and maintaining tissue. So if you're not going to produce milk, there's no reason to, produce, to have all this tissue. Left. And so it degenerates. So. All right, so ceruminous glands are actually modified oil glands that are found in the duct leading into your ear, which is called the external auditory canal or meatus. And the reason why we produce wax is to actually protect our ears. So for most of our history on Earth, we have not lived in houses with screens. And for a good part of our history, we relived in fairly crude dwellings. And then when you're asleep, all these critters crawl around. You. And lots of critters like to crawl down holes. And so you have wax to trap them so they don't get down in there. Otherwise, they get down on your tympanic membrane and walk as they're walking. So it helps trap more particles, critters from getting into the so should you use Q-tips to clean your, your wax every day? You're not supposed to do what? Actually, what you end up doing is, is largely is pushing all the wax right against your tympanic membrane. And that's why you're not supposed to. And elderly people, you can see it because they, you know, as, as elderly people get dementia, behavior patterns become exacerbated. So my stepfather, would he, he'd just stick things in his ear all the time to hide his height all the Q-tips from him. And, so. and then when taking, he, he couldn't hear very well, took him to have his ears checked, and the guy looks in there and says, oh my gosh. And we had to put, we had to put uh, this stuff in his ear, and then have his ear doing this, and then all this black stuff would run out. It took several days to dissolve all that wax and get it out of there that he had crammed in against his tympanic membrane. 
That's why you know. So I need to hold you. So hair is kind of cool in the sense that hair is modified squamous cells fused together. And so what we have in a bulb of our hair is a matrix. And in the matrix is mitotic and it gives rise to the hair. And so since we're giving rise to new cells, then the new cells push the old dead cells upward. And that's why our hair grows, it is because we're constantly doing mitosis in the bulb of of the hair itself, right? And for that to happen, we have to have this little capillary bed uh, that nourishes these cells. And so the reason why people go bald it, over time is these capillary bands actually begin to be occluded and you get no hair uh, blood flow in there and then the hair can't grow. And so what we know is it's a, it's a particular gene uh, and then the gene is influenced by testosterone. Uh, and that's why men go bald uh, earlier in life, and women typically don't go bald. But if you go to a care facility where there's really elderly women, some of them can get very close to being bald uh, because they have the gene for baldness. And when they went through menopause, they stopped making estrogen, and the adrenal gland makes small amounts of testosterone. And so it influences hair patterns after menopause in women. So it's present in all thin skin. As I just said, it's controlled by genetics and sex hormones. Uh, and we have it to protect the underlying skin, it provides the sensory input. Then we have this erector pili muscle that helps us adjust the, our hairs and creates goosebumps when it contracts against hair. So when we look at hair growth, uh, hair doesn't grow at a constant rate. And what we know is hair has a growth period and then it takes a little rest period and then a growth period and then a rest period. So if you have the same person cut your hair for years and years, they can pick out kind of the pattern at which you're, you're doing. So it, it appears that we have a growth period that can last for two to six years and then we have rest periods that last for up to three months where the hair doesn't grow very much at all. And then Old hair falls out uh, as, as your hair stops growing as well uh, because it just breaks off the skin surface. It really doesn't fall out, but the hair breaks off the skin surface. Uh, and both the rate of growth and this replacement cycle can be altered by illnesses. Chronically ill people sometimes hair grows very slowly. They're using a lot of their resources for finding the chronic illness. High fevers will impact hair growth. Surgeries impact hair growth. Blood loss impacts hair growth. Uh, severe emotional stress uh, decreases hair growth. And then it's gender influenced as well. So what's really fascinating is chemotherapy agents are agents we use to target cancer. And the way they target cancer is they stop, they, they're agents that stop mitosis from occurring. So one of our problems with chemotherapy is we we have not been skilled enough, and we're getting there because of new technologies, to understand how to take the agent and only target the tumors. So what we do is give an agent a target that's actively dividing cells, and so most chemotherapy agents then target the matrix, and they inhibit uh, mitosis in the matrix. So that's why a lot of chemotherapy agents. Uh, cause people to lose all of their body hair, all over their body, so they lose their, their eyebrows, the hair on their head, hair everywhere, because it just stops it from growing and breaks off the skin surface. So what's the difference between that Those are different agents. Uh, so it depends on the type of chemotherapy they're doing. So there's a new, there's one of the newer uh, chemotherapy agents uh, uh, targets uh, starving the tumor. So what we know is that there's a compound that body makes that will cause blood vessels to grow. And so we use it in damaged areas to replace blood vessels. Well, some tumors produce a high amount of that compound, and that, that causes blood vessels to grow to the tumor, uh, and then that feeds the tumor. So some of the newer chemotherapy agents prevent that compound 
from allowing blood vessels to grow from the tumor. So it's not stopping mitosis. It's actually directly, but it's stopping mitosis by starting the tumor. So it depends on the type of chemotherapy that you're actually going to use, which is based upon the type of cancer you have and the, the, how aggressive the cancer is going to be. So, so what actually happens if you if you know people are at underground chemotherapy is that sometimes when their hair goes back, it'll be a different color than it was before the chemotherapy. It'll actually also be a different shape. So they may have had really straight hair, but when it grows back, it's curvy. So there, there's there's some real interesting genetic things that happen as well. So hair color is due to melanin. That's why dark hair people have, dark skin people have dark hair, because it's directly due to melanin. So the mutations that we see, which create blonde hair and red hair, are actually changes in the way in which melanin is made. So if you actually add iron, to your melanin, when you're making melanin, your hair is going to be red. And if you add sulfur to the melanin when you're making melanin, your hair is going to be younger. So the different colors in hair are genetic changes, most likely mutations, to the way melanin was being produced by hair follicles itself. So it's kind of interesting to look at. So blonde hair contains sulfur, red hair contains iron. Any graining of hair is due to a decline in the production of melanin. So as you go gray, there's less melanin. As you go completely white, there's no melanin. So people with, with really, really white hair, it's white because there is actually no melanin being produced. So since there's no melanin, then uh, the white spectrum of, view, of visual light is reflected, which makes something white. And you don't have anything like melanin that's reflecting dark light. So, so you put and actually, you can see air bubbles in. So, if you took one of my white hairs here, put it on your mic, so you can actually see little air bubbles in here as well. Okay. So yesterday we looked at we looked at, at hair follicles. We looked at the erectile collagen muscle, the spacious glands associated with it. In this slide, you can actually see the stratum bacilli dropping off of the epidermis and going all the way down around this hair, uh, which supports this right. So yesterday in lab, we looked at binders corpuscles. Uh, binders corpuscles are touch receptors, so they're going to be closer to the skin surface. Uh, so we're, to find one, you have to look in the dermal papillae, uh, and if you're not, you're not going to find them. They're always more loaded in the fingers than they are in, in thick skin, they're more loaded than in thin skin. So the easiest way to find them in lab was to look at your thick skin slide, slide 14. So what you're going to do is look for these upper folds called the filling. And then every once in a while you, you'll see this kind of H-shaped thing. It's got a whirl pattern to it. And that's a migrant's foot muscle. So there's one there. There's actually one right here uh, that you can see. So this was the one we looked at yesterday. And the other was the simian corpuscles. So since they're for pressure, they're going to be down near the hypodermis. So when you're looking for them, you need to look at the junction between the dermis and the hypodermis. And they work by having the skin be compressed and compressing these layers together. And when the layers get compressed together within the simian corpuscle, it generates a, a weak electric current that's sent to the brain for interpretation. Uh, and so they look like uh, cut onions, so they're pretty easy, very large, look like cut onions, so they're pretty easy to pick out. So here's a facidian corpuscles uh, seen in, in the fingertip. And then these are all sweat glands associated with it. Yes? Are either of those, would they cause pain, or do they just cause pressure and touch? Well, pain is a cognitive interpretation of the brain. So if you overstimulate a pressure receptor, it can be perceived as pain. Okay. Okay. So, and that's something we'll work on when we get to the nervous system. And it's something you have to think about for a little while. But when you cut your finger, your finger doesn't hurt. What you did is stimulate receptors in your finger. And then 
that receptor then sends a signal to your brain, and then your brain interprets the signal, and it projects back to you, which is called cognition, that, that you cut your finger and it hurts. So it's a, it's a protective mechanism. So you can have an amputee who's actually lost their arm here, and if the nerve gets stimulated in their elbow, they get phantom pain and their finger will hurt, even though the finger's no longer there. Because what's going on is you're stimulating the nerve, it's going to the brain, the brain's interpreting it. Because the brain was not rewired after the amputation period. Yeah. But abdominally, our abdominal organs do not have pain receptors. But if you feel bloated, like if you're sick, you feel you get a lot of pain in your abdomen. And those are pressure receptors. Okay. The interpretation of overstimulated pressure receptors. Right, so the last thing I want to talk about is healing. Because we have this wonderful surface that prevents us from losing fluids and desiccating, from getting pathogens that actually create problems for us. So when we get openings in our covering, we want to be able to repair the opening as quick as we can to prevent the, the continued loss of blood and fluids and the invasion of pathogens. So what actually happens is there's a, a pattern of, that occurs during the healing process. So what we do is we take the wound healing process and divide it into four phases. So the first phase is the inflammatory phase. Second phase is a migratory phase. A third phase is a proliferative phase. And then the fourth phase is maturation of, of the wound itself. Okay. So when you first cut yourself, what's going to happen is you've got an opening through which uh, bacteria and other pathogens can now enter you. So you want to bring white blood cells into the area as quickly as possible. So what actually happens is the mast cells that we talked about in the underlying areolar tissue release histamine, and histamine is a, is a vasodilator, so that dilates blood vessels to the area, so you get a swelling in that area because you get an increase in blood flow to the area. And what you're doing is recruiting both the clotting material that you need from your blood to make a quick clot, and white blood cells to destroy the cells that are going to die that have been damaged, and pathogens. So you have to do both, right? And so that's why it's called the inflammatory phase. So we get this vasodilation occur that brings white blood cells to the area. Uh, and, then, and so you get a retention of fluid. So once you've, you've, you've brought new cells into the area to take care of that, then what you want to do is reconnect uh, your surface. So remember that normally, what actually happens is that we have these cells that are at the bottom of the epidermis, the ones that are attached to the basic membrane. So what stratum is this that is the bottom layer? Stratobacilli. Stratobacilli. So normally what happens is that when the donor cells form, the one cell stays attached to the basement membrane, and the new donor cell migrates upward. So if you've actually cut an opening in your dermis, epidermis of your skin, there's a factor that's going to be released by the damage of the cells called tissue faction. And what it does is cause these daughter cells to actually migrate in to begin to replace the cells that are gone. And so instead of the cells being pushed up like normal, the cells migrate across the wound. And are eventually going to reconnect the stratum bacilli. And so that's the key to the migratory phase, is you want the daughter cells to migrate across the open wound to actually reconnect the stratum bacilli. So that's the strategy that we use clinically in that if somebody's got a really deep wide wound, it's going to take forever for those cells to migrate across. So what do we do? We pull them together. We suture it. And then we bring the stratum bacilli closer together so that migration process occurs more quickly. 
So we either use sutures, which is string to tie it together, or we can use super glue, or we can use uh, uh, real sticky uh, strapping to do it as well. But it's all to bring that wound closer together so this migration phase doesn't take as much longer. That's why we get less scarring when we do that as well. Right? So what happens once we've reconnected our stratum bacilli is now the cells are going to undergo mitosis rapidly, and now the daughter cells are going to be moving upward. And then we're going to recreate our stratum stenosum, stratum granulosum, and stratum uh, lucidum if it's thick skin, and stratum corneum. So the proliferative phase is an increase in mitosis to recreate the layers to be protected. Do the daughter cells that move in, do they create the missing basement membrane, or is that created by something else? Yeah, so as they begin to do that, so what actually happens is, here, here's the edge of our wound. So this one creates a new daughter cell. As that daughter cell forms, the basement membrane forms. And then this one creates a new daughter cell, and it just moves across. Okay. Right. Yeah. So then, uh, in the maturation phase, then what actually happens is we've recreated all of our underlying tissue layers, and then the scab just comes off, which was an aggregate of uh, tissue that had been put together to, to close the opening uh, temporarily. So scarring occurs because of underlying damage to the dermis of the skin. And so what actually happens is we have to recruit more new fibroblasts. And the fibroblasts have to migrate in and begin to lay down new collagen fibers. And what happens is the, you were, when you're doing it at a rapid rate, the quality of the car, collagen is different and the directional uh, uh, patterns of the collagen are different. So that creates the scar, which is where the collagen fibers are not. So over time, scars can decrease in size depending upon how much damage actually occurs to underlying dermis uh, of the skin. So what, what uh, plastic surgeons need to know is the, is, the relative, is the relative direction of collagen fibers. And you can look in a plastic surgeon book, and there's a whole map of relative directions of collagen fibers on your body. And they have to cut with collagen fibers, and then it doesn't create a lot of scarring. If you cut against collagen fibers, it, it creates more scarring. It's really kind of a to understand the collagen. All right. So as we said, the inflammatory stage, you want to clot your blood so you don't leak again. Then you want to deliver white blood cells to destroy dying tissue and pathogens. During the migratory phase, the blood clot becomes a scab. Epithelial tissues migrate underneath the, underneath the damaged area to repair the, the epithelium. Fibroblasts migrate into the area to repair underlying connective tissue. And then the new tissue is usually darker in color, so it's called granulation tissue. And then the proliferative phase, we get extensive growth of epithelial cells upward. We get increased deposition of collagen fibers by fibroblasts. And the blood vessels that you cut actually grow back together. And that's where we were talking about the compounds that your body makes that cause blood vessels to grow, is what tumors use to draw blood vessels from the skin. So it's called angiogenesis. And so we, we reconnect our vascular network as well. Then during the maturation phase, the scap comes off, collagen fibers can become more organized over time, and the scar will diminish in size, uh, and then fibroblasts uh, convert to fibrocytes, so fibroblasts decrease in them. This is a visual of everything we just talked about. So you can see how what we have to do to reconnect this what we have to have is, is fibroblasts migrate into this area to re reproduce all the collagen that you would have lost in here. And then the squamous cells that are lining their blood vessels have to migrate across and reconnect the blood vessel itself in that process of angiogenesis. So that at the end, we have reconnected our blood vessel. We have made this new thin irregular connective tissue of the dermis, and we have reconnected our epidermis and replaced our layers of, uh, above the front of the cell. 
So as you age, your body it doesn't repair skin as well. So what we see is that elderly people take longer to repair wounds. And as elderly be people become non ambulatory or they're more in bed all the time, then constant pressure against the skin damages the skin and we get bed sores. And then when you get bed sores, then it's just a constant fight to prevent infections and to try to, re re try to, try to get that tissue to replace and repair itself. Uh, so what actually happens is we, we don't produce collagen fibers as well, so collagen decreases in number and collagen becomes stiffer, <coughs> which is why you get more wrinkles as you age. And then if you feel a really elderly person's skin, their skin feels like thin paper. And it's because the collagen fibers are decreasing in number, so the thin is the skin isn't as thin. <coughs> And then elastic fibers decrease in number, which is why we have more wrinkles again. Uh, we get a decrease in number of melanocytes. So uh, elderly people's skin gets whiter, blotchier looking, and the hair grays. Uh, Langer hair cells decrease, uh, which is why we, when you're dealing with elderly populations, you uh, constantly have to worry about skin infections and stuff. And you get a reduce, a redu reduction in number of of uh, faggot section. So those are really something to think about if you deal with elderly populations in the clinical environment. So the other thing in the clinical environment to think about are burns. So the problem with a burn is you've had intense heat on your skin surface and it's caused death of cells. And so you have to manage the, taking care of all the dead cells that die plus then manage fluids and stuff that they're going to lose if it's been a large uh, area of the body that's been affected. So, so, you, so you can get burns from sunburns, you can get burns from hot water, from radiation, from electrical shock, from acids, bases, uh, intense heat. And what you end up with, uh, and what you're concerned about, is that the person's going to end up dying from fluid loss and infection. So the two things that you have to manage if somebody's had a significant burn event is fluid management for them and managing infections. So typically they're going to be in isolation where you can't get up and down and up and put everything on because what's normally on your skin can kill them because their skin is not in place. So that's why we, if you have very bad burns, we don't even, they don't even keep you in Spokane anymore. They ship you to Harvard you in Seattle because they have the region's best burn unit uh, to, to manage all of this. So first degree burns are where the, the epidermis has only been impacted. So the epidermis is really red, the area is painful to touch, and you get a lot of swelling or edema, which causes the blisters that we see. Second degree burns are where the dermis and part of the dermis is blistered. And so now we've got underlying tissue that's been damaged. And what's going to happen, and this is the beauty of understanding that hair develops from epidermis, is if you burn the upper part of your dermis and the epidermis away, but the hair follicles are still in, then the stratum bacillae that was associated with hair follicles is going to help you repair your epidermis because they're from the hair itself. Third degree burns are where the epidermis, dermis, and gore is destroyed. And usually you have to do something like grafts or something because they're not going to be able to replace their own epidermis because all of the underlying tissue, sweat glands and hair, were destroyed as well. All right. And the treatment is IVs to manage fluids and then, uh, and then we have to debreed the wound. So, so what actually happens is initially uh, the cells around the edge of the burn are going to look like they're going to survive, but they're going to die. And so you're going to get cells dying at the edge of the wound. So you have to constantly go in and, and remove those dead cells uh, because otherwise the dead cells are going to create gangrene and you're going to get an issue. So we can actually use some clever tools now. They used to use, it was all mechanically done with razors and stuff. Now we can use maggots because maggots don't like living cells. They only like dead cells. So you can use maggot therapy by putting maggots in the wound it'll just eat the dead cells at the edge. So they, they use it in the heart. 
So if you have a really bad wound, and we have to we have to figure a way to cover the extensive area that's been damaged by fire. Is we can do autographs, which are which are skin from other areas of the person's body. So if you had a lot of burning on your on your hands and stuff, we could take skin off your buttocks or something and move it over there. So I actually had a former student that had a really bad burn on his hand, and uh, they took skin off his buttocks and put it on the palm of his hand. So when I was when I would when I was given the part of the lecture about uh, palmar surfaces, thick skin, lax hair, he'd hold his hand up and say, well, how come I have all this hair on my palm? Because he done the autograph on his buttocks. So, he hair on his palm. so an isograph would be from an identical twin. So there's, a, there's only a, a small subset of the population that can do isographs. And then we've also learned to culture keratinocytes so what we can do with temporary grafts is we can use a homeograph or what's called an allograph, which is from an unrelated person. So it, we, we actually can take skin off of people that have died, their organ donors, and the organs of skin, and then we can cover the wound area with their skin for a while, but it's going to be rejected eventually because it's got the wrong cell identifiers on it. But it, it allows us to allow a recovery for that person. Uh, without as much trouble with infections and or uh, water loss. So we can actually use heterographs or xenographs, which are from, which is skin from another species. And the skin that works the best is pig skin. Yeah, so you can actually use pig skin to cover, cover it for a while to help protect the layer. And then uh, actually the amnion, which is the, the bag that surrounded you when you were inside the uterus, can actually be used as a temporary skin as well. So if you're in a hospital where there's a big birthing suite where there's lots of afterbirth, you can use part of that afterbirth to protect people who have had burns as well. And then we've been working on artificial skin uh, made from silicone and collagen.